All right. Well, at least before the uh, 101 minute mark, at least it connected. <laughs> After being bitten by a radioactive bird, pecked by a radioactive bird, a somewhat mannered T. Tidal was possessed to become Kinius the Sky Dude. This is uh, The Adventures of Kinius the Sky Dude, number 149. We're here in Spain. We finally made it to Spain. Everything's been taking a lot longer than I thought. Sometimes on the map, places look really close together. And they're really far apart. And then some other places, it looks like, oh my god, that's going to take days and days to travel. And it's like, oh, that was only 32 miles. I, sometimes I really question world maps. I really do. They've unnerved me. So, uh... To show you where we're at, let me first of all do, 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 turn on my automatic scene switcher. All right. So just looking out the window today. A very nice day. Kind of like an almost pre programmed day. All right, looking at Bush Talk and zooming out into the world. You see Espanol down there. Well, last week we did this route down here. We came down through Macedonia. And uh, made our way across the Hellespont following the route of Alexander. Made our way all the way to Egypt and then down uh, to the the Gulf here. And uh, followed the route of Alexander all the way up north and out east towards India. Made our way back. Went to uh, Greece. Da, 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 da. Came over here to uh, Rome. Made our way around here, stopped at Marseille, and then the other day from Marseille, again, we didn't make it very far. Uh, so we're right here in the world. And our first job is just going to take us down the road away to near Valencia, uh, to the airport. L-E-M-K, we're delivering, it looks like we're delivering a box of clothing. So we'll make... $21,000 on this flight, which is nice. So when I look at my accounts, it's just spending, 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 spending. It's it's so difficult to make money. <laughs> <laughs> just doing it once or twice a day. And there's the plane rental and everything else. Okay. Grab my coffee. Uh, what else do we need to do? What else do I need to show you before we get going? Oh, yeah. Uh, I've been thinking about, um, Rome a lot as we've been traveling around. You know, what Alexander did and then what, you know, what the Romans kept doing. And I thought, well, I, the Romans took all of this, didn't they? That was the question. I think they did, said my head. And, uh... So I went and looked on YouTube, and sure enough, there's another one of those amazing Kings and Generals channel video on a, a particular general in Spain that the Romans had to deal with. But I also found some of these. Um, do, 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 do. Where'd it go? I just had it. in my YouTube scene. Don't worry, I'll find it. YouTube. Okay. So I found this here. The animated history of Spain from Tartessos to Rome. So probably do that after we take off. We'll listen to a little bit of that in the background. Um, again, looking at where we're at. The audio tours that are, if I were to turn around and head us right back towards the coast, the three audio tours that are here are La Morella, a mountain located in uh, Beguas, Munis municipality, Catalonia, Spain. The Gareth Massif is a mountain range, Catalan coastal range. And La Plana Novella. Planet of El is an old country estate and village located on a small plain in the middle of the uh, Garaf Massif National Park. Okay, so we're going to skip those. As we head down the road, we have a battle that took place. Spanish Division. Uh, we'll get to that one here in a minute. Uh, 
an aqueduct. Maybe we'll be able to see that. Hopefully the terrain has it in there. Two overlapping each other right in the middle of this town. A water ride. Again, I don't know if we'll see that or not. Two Tookie Splash oh, no, no. a water ride. Opened in 1995 at Port Aventura Park in the resort. Okay. Bum, bum, bum. Another battle over here. Okay. All right. Well, we have everything set up in the computer. Uh, I've got the flight plan already set to take us uh, to where we need to go here. Do you have any pre-flight questions? If so, don't. Don't hesitate to ask if you have any questions. Uh, if you're new to Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh-oh, you know what we need to do? Oh, I probably have to shut the engine off. I do. Look at our fuel. This is the reason why we had to land last time, just end the show. Forgot about that, and I don't want to make the same mistake. I forgot to refuel. But Neofly won't let you... Will not let you refuel with your engine on. So this is one way to quickly just... Oh, it says we're full here, though. They're supposed to be synced. We have uh, our first problem of the day. I'll add a tiny bit more in here. But it is supposed to be synced in here. There, now that's synced. Okay. All right. Well, we're good to go now. Probably, pardon the beeping. Do landing lights on, taxi light off. Okay, thank you, Alana. Sorry about that. I'm sorry I didn't check that. Gotta make sure that's set to on and repeat. All right. This is our first time traveling through Spain. It's part of the world tour. Now that we're gaining experience... And we've done uh, all the things required when we're a newbie pilot. And we flew lots around Colorado in the first year. And uh, then we had to do our cross countries. So small ones. Then we started doing larger and larger ones all across the United States. Then we did the massive one. Okay, pilot. Steady away. See you again soon. The big one that took us all the way from Colorado, all the way down through Texas, through Mexico, all the way through South America, ending up at the tip of Argentina. Didn't want to do the Antarctic. And then, hanging out with Henny and Hans, decided to move operations to Germany. Barcelona approach Kinias 2-1 is type Cessna caravan one miles west of Lima Echo Alpha Victor 1,400 feet. And this is just how... Flight following. Just how I imagine Spain. Squawk 5457 Kinias 21. Squawk 4. What was it? Squawk 4. What was it? We had better. Roger, Kinias 2-1. We had better set it to autopilot here for a minute. We're going to stall out. All right. And set it to nav. See if, it can, see if it will figure out what to do with itself. Sometimes when you switch it over to nav, it doesn't. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't want to move on. The flight plan that's in there so to get it to kick in i just usually do a direct to then i'll take whatever's next in the flight plan 
So in this case, a user enter a uh, user spot. Look at the flight plan. Yeah, user 01, user 02, user 03. So once it hits that, it'll start continuing on through the flight plan now. So it looks just like I thought Spain would look. Starting to get some clouds, so I might have to mess with the weather. And we better altitude hold here. Get a little too high. Okay. So we only have 25 miles to do. Let me go ahead and put on that video and at least we'll hear what they have to say about the history real quick. Um, if there's a big chop right here going forward and you're not hearing it, just all of a sudden everything's moved up and there was no audio playing in the background talking about the history of Spain, there was a copyright problem. They had a problem with it and they don't want me to, they didn't want me to use their content on this show. So I apologize if there's a big cut, if there isn't a big cut, then everything is fine and they're really cool. The prehistoric Iberian peoples of Spain built megalithic structures, towns, and cities. Much of their culture is shrouded in mystery. Beginning in the 11th or 12th century BC, Phoenician merchants from modern day Lebanon began trading with the Iberians and would eventually build colonies along Iberia's eastern and southern coasts. They would come into contact with the civilization of Tartessos, who would be famed throughout the Mediterranean for their wealth in tin, copper, and gold. The Phoenicians, who were the renowned seafarers and merchants of their day, came under ever-increasing pressure from the growth of the Assyrian Empire. To escape the Assyrians, and later the Persians, many Phoenicians opted to leave home and colonize the western Mediterranean. Their greatest city would be Carthage, which would one day dominate all the other Phoenician colonies. Yeah, we went there. During this time, Rome was just a regional power struggling to gain control of their Italian neighbors. To the east of Rome, the ever squabbling Greek city-states managed to colonize the area around the Black Sea, the coast of modern-day Libya, Sicily, Italy, southern France, and also the northeast coast of Spain. Originating near modern-day Hallstatt, Austria, Celtic culture and people would spread as far east as modern-day Turkey, into northern Europe, and also into Spain. Here, the native Iberian tribes incorporated elements of Celtic, Phoenician, and Greek society into their own. These extremely warlike people would develop a sophisticated culture and a variety of writing forms influenced by Celtic, Greek, and Phoenician. The Iberian Peninsula was rich in tin and copper that needed alloy to create bronze, as well as gold, silver, and iron. These metals were the crude oil of the ancient world, fueling civilized society, needed for everything from construction tools, agricultural equipment, weapons and armor to currency. By the 3rd century BC, the city-state of Carthage had become an empire, consolidating much of the western Mediterranean under its control. After a long series of wars, Rome would unite the Italian peninsula. Rome would then set its sights on Carthage. And after a series of three wars known as the Punic Wars, Rome was triumphant. It took many hard-fought campaigns for Rome to absorb Carthage's Iberian territory. It would take Rome more than 200 years to fully subdue the entire Iberian peninsula. <laughs> Dang. On my next video on Spain, I will be focusing on the Roman conquest of Spain, Roman Spain, and the collapse of the Roman Empire. 
This has been Epimetheus. Don't forget to hit that like button and uh, subscribe if you like the content and would like to see more of it and hit that bell icon if you would like to get notifications when I make new videos. I'm a one-man operation doing all the drawing, editing, putting the video together, narrating, and if you would like to enable me to make more content like this more often, consider supporting me on Patreon. Yeah. Like the Uber, Jody, Balaz, and Morpheus. Thank you so much. <laughs> he, uh... He, uh... Sounds just like one of my friends. He's got that kind of... Deeper voice. Uh, now we're so we're flying along Spain here. Uh, pardon me. Everything went really quiet without the video running. I turned down the the engine noise and the air traffic control noise, and I've got the uh, AI handling the radios, so we can just look at things. That like like that out there. I don't know what it is, but it's very pretty. It's just a business complex. I guess from watching all the spaghetti westerns growing up. And El Cid and other things. You know, I've come to understand what Spain is supposed to look like from all the movies. And it looks just like I, I thought it would. You know, all the little rolling hills. and So that was neat, learning about the earlier history. And uh, the people that were here. And then all the movement from the Phoenicians moving everything around. And then the Greeks moving everything around. And then the uh, Persians were even mentioned in there. It's crazy they came all the way up here and uh and then the romans taking 200 years sometimes it feels that way when you're playing rome total war it's like oh my god that's so far away and then you realize that was nothing compared to how far you have to go it does feel like it takes 200 years sometimes that was a nice racetrack out there something yeah Okay. Uh, we we should actually go on then with this gentleman's videos. Um, but now how he didn't make it easy for me to get to this one. Do, 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 do. What's the next? What's the next one? Ah! Right, it's out of order because the next one that we go to right off the bat is the rise of the Neo Assyrian Empire, and we don't want that. He just said the next one will do the history of Spain. Huh. Here is a different video. The Roman Empire in Spain and Portugal. Bra. Roman rule in the region lasted for the best part of 600 years, and its effects are still deeply felt today through language, culture, and the presence of countless ancient Roman sites. So in this video, let's explore Roman Hispania, the story of its conquest by the Romans, the geography of the region under Roman rule, and the Roman architecture that we can still see today. And if you do plan to visit the region in the future, perhaps this video can also help orient you to the potential places you can visit. To many of the ancient Mediterranean civilizations further east, the Iberian Peninsula was a distant, mysterious land on the far western edge of the known world. But distance aside, it was also rich in all kinds of natural resources, especially metal ores, and so became a prime target for colonization. The Greeks arrived from the north through their existing colonies in what is now southern France and colonized the eastern coast of the peninsula, especially the region near the mouth of the Abro River. The Greek name for the region, Iberia, came from the same root as the Abro. 
Another maritime people, the Phoenicians, arrived by way of their pre-existing North African colonies and established many trading posts centered around the Guadalquivir River, among which was the poor city of Gadir, modern-day Cadiz. Prior to the arrival of the colonists, the region had already been settled by a number of ancient tribes, many of which are now lost to history. In the south and east were the Iberians, who spoke extinct non-Indo-European languages. In the southwest were the Tartessians, who also spoke their own extinct languages. The Tartessians actively traded with the Phoenicians, especially ores like silver and tin. Further inland were the Celtiberians, made up of Celts who had migrated from other parts of Europe, along with more local, Celticized peoples. In the far north and extending into modern-day France were the Aquitani, who gave name to the modern region of Aquitaine in southwestern France, and whose language was a precursor to the modern Basque. Catherine of Aquitaine. The Phoenician colonies in southern Iberia eventually became dominated by the city of Carthage in North Africa, itself a Phoenician colony. Carthage had a maritime empire of its own, but after being defeated by Rome in the First Punic War from 264 to 241 BC, it was forced out of most of the western Mediterranean. The wounded Carthaginians, under the nobleman and general Hamilcar Barca, shifted their focus to Iberia. Hamilcar conquered large parts Hannibal. of southern Iberia for the Carthaginians and incorporated many Iberians into his army as mercenaries. Hamilcar was killed in 228 BC while campaigning, and his son-in-law, Hasdrubal, took over. Under Hasdrubal, the Carthaginians founded a new city, which the Romans later renamed Carthago Nova, or New Carthage, modern-day Cartagena. After Hasdrubal was assassinated in 221 BC, Hamilcar's now grown-up son, Hannibal, mm -hmm. took over. The Hannibal continued the Carthaginian bridge, part of the Roman aqueduct built to supply water to the ancient city of Toraco today Tarragona in Catalonia, Spain. The bridge is located four kilometers north of the city and it is part of the archaeological ensemble of Toraco. The Toraco aqueduct took water from the Francoli River, 15 kilometers north of Tarragona. It probably dates from the time of the Emperor Augustus. Le Ferre's aqueduct is composed of two levels of arches, the upper section has 25 arches, and the lower one has 11. Ah, there it is there. An expansion into the peninsula, and eventually the Romans became wary of him. In 218 BC, after Hannibal had sacked the pro-Roman city of Saguntum, the Romans declared war, starting the Second Punic War. In some of the most famous events in military history, Hannibal marched an army overland through the Pyrenees and Alps into Italy, soundly defeated the Romans multiple times, including at the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC, and almost captured Rome itself. But slowly, as the years passed and Hannibal's army got bogged down in Italy, the Romans extended their reach into Iberia. After various failed campaigns in the region, the Romans appointed the general Publius Cornelius Scipio to lead a new campaign. Scipio decisively defeated the Carthaginians at the Battle of Ilipa in 206 BC, after which the Carthaginians were forced out of the peninsula. Scipio followed up this success in 202 BC when he invaded Carthage itself and handed Hannibal his final defeat at the Battle of Zama. Scipio was awarded the honorific title Africanus. The Carthage the Carthaginian Empire was no more, and the Romans became the masters of bum, Iberia. Bum, bum, the Romans divided the peninsula, which they called Hispania, into two provinces. The first, with its capital at Taraco, was Hispania Ceterior, or nearer Hispania, so named because it was the closer of the two provinces by land to Rome. The second, with its capital at Corduba, modern-day Cordoba, was Hispania Uterior, or further Hispania. All right, so here's a really weird... Uh... Trivia. Dun, 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 dun. Once I get over here to the right screen. That's what we're watching. And it shows that we're up in here. Espinius Terrier, right? Uh, Taraco. That's pretty much right where we're at right now. We're, what he's talking about. But he mentioned Cordoba. Right? That's the family, or that's the name Port of. Aventura Park is a theme park located in the. Everybody's Port talking when I want to talk. Resort, eighty-five kilometers southwest of Barcelona. Oh, this is the water park. Catalonia, Spain, in the municipalities of Salou and Vila Seca, on the Costa Dorada. The park opened to the general public on the second of May, nineteen ninety-five, under the management of the Two Swords Group, which had a forty point zero one percent share in the park. 
La Caixa, Anheuser-Busch and Fexer. The park has a variety of rides for the whole family, including thrill rides such as Dragon Khan, El Diablo, Huracan Condor, Shambhala, Furious Baco, and Stampeda. Nice. All right, like they got a little Disneyland over there. Uh, that's my family name, Cord Cordoba. But in, in the United States or however, it, it, they, you know, they drop the B and they add the V, Cordova. So, so it, it seems that my bloodline has some history over here. So it seems. Okay. Uh, unpause. Uh, go back over to this guy. Yeah, from these two bases, the Romans set out oh. to expand into the rest of the peninsula. In order to make sense of the rest of the video, it is important that we devote some time to orient ourselves to the general geography of the region, which can be quite difficult to learn, although it doesn't have to be this way, and I will try to simplify it as much as possible. The defining features of the peninsula are its mountains, which generally run parallel to each other because they were mostly formed in relatively recent geological times from the African plate crashing into the European plate, causing furrows to form in the land. There are five major rows of these mountains. The first row, in the far north, consists of the Pyrenees that separate the peninsula from the rest of Europe and their western extension, the Cantabrian Mountains along the northern coast of Spain. Next is a mountain range collectively named the Central System, although its peaks are better known by their local names, such as the Sierra de Guadarrama immediately north of Madrid, or the Sierra de Estrela that mark the highest point in continental Portugal. After this are three more rows of mountains, the Toledo Mountains, the Sierra Morena, and finally, overlooking the southern coast of Spain, the Betic Mountains. One additional mountain range, the Iberian System, run somewhat perpendicular to the central system. These mountains, in turn, subdivide the peninsula into multiple river basins. We have already covered two of these rivers, the Ebro and the Guadalquivir. They empty into or near the Mediterranean and so were easily colonized by Mediterranean-based powers. Three more major rivers flow westward into the Atlantic, the Doral River, between the Cantabrian Mountains and the central system and flowing into the Atlantic at the modern-day city of Porto, the Tagus River between the Central System and the Toledo Mountains and flowing into the Atlantic at Lisbon, and the Guadiana River between the Toledo Mountains and the Sierra Morena with its lower stretch forming part of the border between Spain and Portugal. The basins of these five rivers make up most of the peninsula. Although these rivers tend to be poorly suited for navigation, the Romans were still able to expand into the peninsula along their valleys. The interplay between the mountains, rivers, and surrounding ocean currents create three distinct climate zones in the peninsula. This is of course a generalization, and there are many microclimates throughout the region, but it's still helpful to think of it in terms of these general zones. The far north, sandwiched between the Atlantic and the rugged Cantabrian mountains, is cold, wet, and green. The coastal regions in the west and south have Mediterranean climates with sunny beaches and fairly fertile soils. The majority of the peninsula, separated from the ocean by mountains on all sides, is a windswept area plateau. But to the Romans, what the interior lacked in terms of agricultural resources, it more than made up for with mineral wealth, especially gold and silver. Okay, I got a question for you. Are Idea. you a Okay. If you uh, you know what? That commercial came at the bottom of the hour. It is time for the, uh, the, uh, the, the commercial break. So I've tried not flooding you with commercial breaks. They, they'll they play no matter what, but I've tried to set up at 30-minute intervals. So we should be having our first break here. And uh, with that, turn this back up here. So we have something going on in the background. And we'll be doing our song of the day. Today's song is going to be uh, You and Me by Arthur Yoria. If you want details on where to pick up the track, pick up the album or the whole discography, which he's got a lot, then check the details. All right. Uh, smoke if you got them. It's a smoking flight. You get like 10,000 no points for this flight if you're keeping track of your points. You'll be able to redeem those possibly at some point in the future for thank yous. I, I don't know. I really should. I should start creating like a Sky, Dub, Sky Dude mug and a Sky Dude t-shirt and uh, any other kind of Sky Dude stuff. 
Scotty poster, I don't know. And then you... I dole out so many points for each live stream, like frequent flyer miles. And then if you accumulate so many frequent flyer miles, then you tell me, hey, Kenius, I've watched 50, 57 of your videos, 57 days of live streaming. Uh, how about that free mug? So maybe we should do stuff like that. Some incentive, right? They're like, always figure out a way to build an incentive. All right. Today's song of the day. Dun, 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 over here. And I will be back in three minutes or so. Oh. I think I've screwed up. Let's see. There we go. I did. Of course. Be right back. So, You and Me by Arthur Yoria. 
uh, up the anisotropic filtering to try to get uh, everything looking a little bit better. Now that we're at this altitude, and shouldn't cause it's a little couple of little micro stutters here and there, but I wanted to make everything look as nice as possible. So we're just tuning in. Welcome, welcome. Oh, let me say this: since we're still kind of on the break, uh, if you need a subscriber, I'm it. Just jump into the chat room, say hi, and uh, that will allow me to quickly go to channel. It gives me the go to channel option. I can go right to your channel and subscribe to you. And it doesn't matter if you have any content or not. We all need a subscriber. So if you need one, I need one. So please like and subscribe uh, if you enjoyed any bit of this. And uh, yeah. Check out my adventures, all the older adventures when I like when I first started doing this. It's been fun. It's definitely been a lot of fun. Gained a lot of experience. Uh, it's very much like <laughs> very much like role-playing games. Like, how do you get experience? Well, you get experience. I mean, just more experience is more experience. That's very pretty down there. Very, very pretty. It's hard to say who the original peoples are. And they said a lot of people have been lost through time. That was a very interesting statement he made. You know, different tribes and people that have conquered. And, you know, so it's really hard to say, you know, who were the original indigenous peoples? That is just lovely. Just, what a lovely place. Um, just pause for a second. What is, where are we? Do, 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 do. We are follow the circles. We are here. Okay. No names. There we go. Tortosa. This is actually where I think where he's starting the history right here. I think that's the name I just said a minute ago. Where all the Roman stuff started happening. Let's get back to that. Their lands, although what time they became more... Oh, he's doing the geography still, but... In BC, the Iberian tribes on the coast rebelled, although it was easily crushed by the Romans. Further inland, the Celt-Iberian tribes put up much stronger resistance against the Romans, oh, and the me. two sides fought the each Ebro other Delta on and off the for oh my lord. The Ebro River Some of the, the most southwest of the province of Tarragona in the region of... <laughs> a lot of overlapping the audio tours. The Ebro Delta is one of the largest wetland areas in the western Mediterranean region, at 320 kilometers squared. Wow, wow. The Ebro Delta has expanded rapidly on soils washed down river. The town of Amposta, a seaport in the 4th century, demonstrates the historical rate of growth of the delta as it is now located well inland from the current river mouth. The rounded form of the delta attests to the balance between sediment deposition by the Ebro and removal of this material by wave erosion. Wow. Yeah, you definitely see, you definitely see it. Yeah. I wonder if it'd still be a good place to look for gold. Everything always running that way. Okay. Powerful of the Celtiberians were the Lusitanian people, Lusitanian. based largely out of modern-day Portugal. They handed the Roman multiple heavy defeats until eventually the Roman general sued for peace. But this was a trap. In 152 oh. BC, as the Lusitanians gathered to accept the peace offerings from the Romans, they were ambushed and massacred. Oh One my! Of the few Lusitanians to escape was a shepherd named Viriathus, who swore revenge. Viriathus soon became the new leader of the Lusitanians and led his people on guerrilla campaigns against the Romans, winning many victories in the process. 
To subdue Variathus, the Romans again resorted to treachery. They held peace negotiations with the Lusitanians, during which Variathus sent three of his most trusted commanders to negotiate with the Roman general. The Roman general secretly promised those three commanders a large sum of money for them to betray Variathus, who was then murdered in his sleep. <laughs> According to popular legend, when the three assassins then asked the Romans for their prize money, they were told that Rome does not pay traitors and executed. The Lusitanian resistance gradually fell apart after the death of Variathus, and the Romans eventually conquered the region for good. Variathus is now considered one of the great national heroes of Portugal. Outside of the Lusitanians, the Romans also faced significant resistance from other Celtiberian tribes, especially those from the city of Numantia on the Douro River. The city revolted multiple times in the 150s and 140s BC, until the Romans finally had enough and sent one of their top generals, Scipio Emilianus Africanus, to pacify the city. He raised a large army against Numantia in 134 BC, and taking advantage of Roman engineering skills, built an entire outer wall around Numantia to starve the city. The defenders offered to surrender in exchange for their freedom, but Scipio refused. They began to run out of food, cannibalism ensued, and many defenders yeah. committed suicide. Finally, the remaining defenders set the city on fire and then surrendered to the Romans, who then completely leveled what was left of Numantia. After the fall of Numantia, almost all of Hispania fell under Roman rule. The Romans established many colonies in the region, and the local population gradually Romanized. The mountainous far north remained independent for another century, until Augustus, the first Roman emperor, launched invasions against the mountain tribes living there, the Cantabri in modern-day Cantabria, and the Asturias in modern-day Asturias. The ensuing wars, known as the Cantabrian Wars, lasted from 29 BC to 19 BC, with the mountain tribes again resorting to guerrilla warfare against the invaders. The wars were extremely brutal. The Romans took no prisoners, and the defenders often chose to commit suicide rather than surrender anyway. Even after the war ended, the region still frequently rebelled against Roman rule, and three Roman legions had to be stationed in the area to maintain peace. As the region slowly assimilated under Roman rule in the late 1st century AD, the three legions were eventually reduced to only one legion. The city that developed around the legionary camp was named Legio, and it gave name to the Spanish city and the medieval Spanish kingdom of Leon. Under Augustus, the two pre-existing provinces in the peninsula were reorganized into three provinces, Hispania Terraconensis, Hispania Baetica, and Lusitania. Terraconensis was by far the largest of the three provinces, in part because it consolidated under the leadership of a single governor the two most important roles that Augustus needed a governor in Hispania to fulfill, ensuring that its mineral riches were successfully delivered to Rome and maintaining the loyalty of the legions guarding these mineral riches. For these reasons, Terraconensis was classified as an imperial province, in that the governors were appointed directly by the emperor in order to ensure their loyalty. The most significant mines in Terraconensis were located in the north, especially modern-day Galicia in northwestern Spain. The main Roman city in this region, Lucas Augusti, became modern-day Lugo, famous for its well-preserved Roman walls. The gold and tin mined around Lugo were sent to the nearby poor city of Brigantium and exported to the rest of the empire. Brigantium became modern-day Acarunia, where the Roman lighthouse, the oldest still continuously in use today, is now one of many Roman UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Spain. The most famous mine in Terraconensis was the gold mine at Las Medulas, the largest in the empire. Starting in the second half of the 1st century AD, the Romans utilized hydraulic mining techniques in which they dug deep tunnels into the mountains and then quickly filled the tunnels with water, so that eventually the water pressures will wash away the bedrocks to expose the ores. This mine remained productive for over 250 years, and the water mining caused the mountains in the region to collapse, leading oh. to the strange landscape we see today. Besides the gold and tin mines in the north, Terraconensis also has significant mines in the Sierra Morena that produce silver along with byproducts like lead and mercury. The Romans very much worked many of the natives to death as slaves in the mines. In a sad irony of history, the descendants of these subjugated peoples will in turn do the same thing 15 centuries later to the Native Americans in the mines of Mexico, Peru, and Bolivia. Terraconensis was named after its capital at Terraco, modern-day Tarragona. 
It was a major city in Roman times, but its role as a premier city in the region has long been replaced by Barcelona, an hour to the north by train. Nonetheless, it preserves some incredible Roman ruins, including an amphitheater and an aqueduct, which, at least when I visited in 2016, I was allowed to walk on. To the west of Tarragona, at the intersection of the main road and the Ebro River, was the city of Caesar Augusta. The Roman emperors really liked naming cities after themselves, <laughs> which became Zaragoza. Alexander did. Zaragoza, the main Roman road, continued along the valley of the Ebro River, including the modern-day Rioja wine region. It's like a prerequisite. Using wine for hunt over Roman soldiers back then, and then <clears> through <throat> the landscapes of northern Spain, past Leon, past Lugo, all the way to the Atlantic. This route is now a portion of the popular Camino de Santiago pilgrimage road, although a lot less exciting to hike on than the scenic mountain roads further north. One more Roman city to point out in this region was Segovia, which has one of the largest, best-preserved Roman aqueducts in existence. Tarraconensis had two more noteworthy roads. One road ran southwest from Zaragoza and crossed the Tagus River at Toledo, modern-day Toledo, on a bridge that is still standing today although the rest of the city is now much more famous for its later medieval buildings. Another road followed the coastline south from Taraco to Sagunto and Valencia, modern-day Valencia, and then to Cartagena, from which the road and our narrative entered the neighboring province of Hispania Baetica. Hispania Baetica, or simply Baetica, was much smaller than Terraconensis and centered around the Guadalquivir River, known to the Romans as the Baetis River. It mostly corresponds to the modern-day Spanish region of Andalusia. The key Roman export here was olive oil, and to this day, Andalusia remains the number one olive oil-producing region in the world, with nowhere else on the planet even remotely coming close. Other major products included grains, wine, and garum, a fermented fish sauce that was a key ingredient in the Roman diet. The poor cities in Baetica produced some of the best garums in the empire. Southwestern Baetica also has significant mines that remain active to this day, and the local river that flows through this area, Rotinto, has long been famous for the reddish color of its waters due to dissolved minerals and pollution. Baetica was densely settled and heavily urbanized. Its capital was Cordoba, better known today as one of the capitals of Moorish Spain. The Roman bridge across the Guadalquivir remains a major symbol of the city and is still used today. Another location in the city to find Roman ruins is the Mesquita itself, since many of its interior columns were clearly scavenged from earlier Roman buildings. Downstream from Cordoba was Hispalis, modern-day Seville, and the neighboring town of Italica, now a suburb of Seville and the site of multiple Roman ruins, including an amphitheater where the dragon pit scenes from Game of Thrones were filmed. And finally, on the coast was the major port city of Cadiz. The main road from Cartagena took a bend northward across the Baetic Mountains into the Guadalquivir Valley, then passed through Cordoba and Seville all the way to Cadiz. Baetica was one of the most Romanized regions in the empire outside of Italy, and as early as the 1st century AD, many of its elites were already prominent in Roman politics. Unlike Terraconensis, it was a senatorial province in that its governors were appointed by the Roman Senate rather than the emperors. Trajan, one of the greatest Roman emperors, was born in Italica, where he also likely spent a significant portion of his youth. He was succeeded by his nephew Hadrian, who also came from Italica, but liked to tell people that he was from Rome itself. He came so from Italica. Hadrian and Hadrian marked the peak of the Roman Empire. In addition to the two emperors, the politician and philosopher Seneca, who wrote some of the most influential works in Stoicism, also came from this province in Cordoba. The last of the three traditional Roman provinces in Hispania was Lusitania, named after the Lusitanians mentioned earlier in this video. It roughly corresponds to modern-day Portugal, and the name Lusitania is still frequently used today as an alternative name for the country. As an aside, the ship RMS Lusitania, which the Germans sunk early on in World War I, was named after this province, and it even had a sister named the RMS Mauritania after the nearby Roman province in what is now Morocco. Major cities in Lusitania included Olisipo. I want to pause right there. On our map here in Bush Talk, Saying just off our side over there where we're looking, there's a there's a castle. I I don't know uh I don't know what any of these if any of these formations out there are that or we haven't we can't see it, but either way. See us there. It's supposed to be right over here. 
Peniscola Castle is a castle in Peniscola, Castellón, Valencian community, Spain. The castle is restored and is open to the public. The castle is situated on a crag overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, at an altitude of 64 meters above okay. the mean sea level. The earliest evidence of habitation in the area were Ibero Roman remains excavated in the port of Peniscola, they date to the 1st to 2nd centuries BC. Arab writer al Idrisi described Baniscula in the 11th century AD and briefly described a Moorish castle overlooking the sea. The current form of the castle is essentially that developed by the Knights Templar, who planned to develop oh, a kingdom centered on Peniscola. James II of Aragon gave <coughs> the castle to the Templars in 1294, together with the nearby castles of Pulpis and Zivert. The Templars began work that year demolished the Muslim fortifications, and completely rebuilt the castle. The work was completed in 1307. Uh, um, I'm going to keep my opinions on that one to myself. Now Lisbon, the capital of Lusitania, though, was much further inland at Augusta and Merida, now the small city of Merida in remote southwestern Spain. It was established as a colony for retired Roman soldiers and was strategically located on the Guadiana River as a major transportation hub connected to Lisbon, Seville, Cordoba, Toledo, and the mines of Galicia. Merida still has some of the most impressive Roman ruins in existence, including the bridge and the Roman theater, both of which are still in use today, although its remote location does make it quite out of the way to visit. Like other parts of the peninsula, Lusitania too was rich in mining, agriculture, and garum. It also played an important role in transportation. The north-south mm. roads connected many parts of Baetica to Terraconensis, and the poor cities on the Atlantic helped maintain the safety of Roman shipping, whether it was food shipments from Baetica to the front lines of Germania, or goat shipments from Galicia to Rome. One of the three provinces in Hispania, Terraconensis, also possessed territories outside of Hispania, the Balearic Islands, where beach towns like Ibiza are now located. Before its conquest by the Romans, the islands had been under Carthaginian rule and were famous for its slingers, many of whom served under Hannibal during the Second Punic War. Carthage lost control of the islands after its defeat in the Second Punic War, although the Romans initially did not care enough to control it either, and so it became a bit of a wild west of the ancient Mediterranean and a haven for pirates. The Romans eventually did annex the islands in 123 BC and established two major settlements, Palentia, modern-day Alcudia in the north, and Palma, which is today the largest city in the islands, in the south. The two cities became important stopping points for ships traveling between Hispania and other parts of the empire. The islands, although small, still exported many goods to the rest of the empire, including wheat, fish, and dice. The Balearic slingers continued to serve with distinction as auxiliaries in Roman armies. When I learned about Mind Bloom, Mind Bloom. Mind Bloom. We're in the future, man. Mind Bloom. All right. What is next? So we're traveling down the AP2. Just just to our left, there's the highway there. And we're just passing this little town here. Alcala de Zivert. I've been saying it over and over and over again on every show that it blows my mind. I mean, listen to the history that we're listening to, how far it goes back. We're talking about the Persians were up here, Phoenicians were over here, everybody's been over here, the Greeks were over here, The Ro this is all about the Roman stuff now, yada, yada, yada. And it doesn't look like New York. It doesn't look like the United States. There's not crap everywhere and skyscrapers everywhere and... I mean, occasionally you see some big buildings, but it's nothing like the United States. 
and the, the type of cities that we have. Hop back into the cockpit, but not how we how far we have to go here. Quite a ways. 21, 27 just to the next waypoint. So 30 minutes or so. We're nearing the top of the hour. Play that song of the day again. Take a smoke break. Doing good on fuel. Oh, you know, that reminds me. I need to put the separator in. Silly, silly. That's not that big of a deal. This what it does is it's the inertial separator. Spock, tell them what it does. It uh, diverts heavy particles away from the engine and exhausts them when you're close to the ground. This high up, we really don't have to worry about it. Um, now, the propeller, it's, this is a variable pitch propeller. Okay? means that uh, Meaning that if I move the blue lever here, it changes the angle of the propeller as it chews into the wind. So think of this as full forward as maximum chew, right? The blades are slicing into the wind, chewing as much as it can to propel the aircraft forward. So pulling the propeller back, it's just like a nom nom, you know, small chew. And, you know, kind of just enough to keep us going and maintaining the speed that we're going. This one I can't, the red one, I can't adjust incrementally as far as i know it's only got a couple of settings like high medium and off so in other planes you can control to a great degree your engine mixture which can help greatly reduce fuel uh this should always be standard it should be standard in every vehicle we should just you know like well the computer can do it well yeah sort of i mean yeah i these days i suppose but you can't trust a computer and a programmer and people in this world. You just can't. I mean, we've 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 been learning our lesson for thousands of years now. You should be the one in control of your your mix, or we should still have options like that. I keep thinking about modern cars and everything's just getting too damn expensive. I think they are setting us up for total collapse. Everything's inflating, hyperinflating, and it can't continue. Everywhere you look in every corner, everybody's hyperinflating prices. And one area that's really bothering me right now is the great internet conspiracy. They're doing it. All the web hosts, GoDaddy, all the big boys, and people that are now big on the block like Wix. Like, oh, we're big now. We're going to pull some shady crap on you. We used to be really cool. We used to have the best editors the, the coolest stuff and now we're just like everybody else and but now we have all this cool ai and da, 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 things that you really you know unless you're really awesome you really don't need so people are like dude i just am hosting my artwork that you know that's it i'm not i'm stupid because i am not taking advantage of all those things and i'm not leveraging that to try to you know financially support myself you know, I'm not good with business. Maybe that's too much information. But uh, the short story is they've gone from seven dollars a month to twenty three dollars a month, and there's no so far there's been no negotiating with them. They're just like take it or leave it. We have all this new technology and all this great stuff. And I'm like, but I don't use any of that. I am I started when your company started and all I've ever needed was the basic web hosting services like when, when you began. <laughs> like, but all these great features. And I'm like, but I don't use those features. And they keep insisting, well, you have all these great features. Yeah, I understand that, but currently that's not where I'm at. So, no exceptions. So now, same with GoDaddy. Everybody's inflating prices. You want a web website over there? Sure. 
four bucks a month for the first 12 months but after that it goes to almost 200 over 200 dollars so they're going to start hyperinflating that i mean the all it can do is go up now they won't come down unless something happens so what about a year from now when it goes from 20 to 40 now it's 300 300 there 300 there you'll have no choice but to sell the small timers I don't like it sir I don't like it at all sirs and or madam madams I see conspiracy in everything now the world has made me that way I didn't want to and grow up hey I, man get into those conspiracy theories that's what I want to do no, man, I just wanted to draw maybe some cartoons and comic books. And that was the greatest ambition. So just being a dude who hangs out and draws and does flight simulator and plays video games and but mostly it drawing. That's mostly what I'm known for. I'm, you know, I can't say I'm Michelangelo. Uh, and while I have a website up, if you're interested, again, there's nothing to it. I mean, it's I'm a crap, I don't, web design, I don't, I know, I'm a, an artist, but sometimes art and web design, they're not hand in hand. I draw things, I don't, I've never created websites. Um, so all I know how to do is use an, uh, a website to post like my pictures and my art, and that's the extent of it. So if you would like to see what I do, uh, there are links on the channel. And I'll go ahead and put one in the uh, in the chat room. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about me, I'm not, uh, you know. I didn't start again to be a political uh, entity or or anything, and I think that that the work you'll see over there shows what I what I was really doing with the first half of my life and my interest, my interests. Then you can follow my interests by checking out just my YouTube page. I wanted to do like some cool little animated music videos, you know, play some video games. Hang out with Star Trek people. And that was a lot of fun. That was, that was probably the greatest stuff ever. It's become really toxic, and it's not the place it was until everybody chills out. I'm really not participating anymore. But it's sad. It the, like other than like cartoons, comic books, video games, a fooling around, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and Star Trek. So from the time I was like three years old, watching Star Trek. And th that, uh, being a super fan, uh, you know, we're literally one of those Shatner get a life kind of people. I guess I'm trying to keep reinforcing how non-political non-conspiracy theory you know kind of a person i was wasn't into business wasn't into you know news politics uh da -da 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 -da. so yeah uh and trying to make people happy you need a logo you need a drawing you need some cover art you need an editorial art whatever you need what go look at the website like uh, trying to make myself a commercial artist i wanted to be a commercial artist still am but you know nobody's calling nobody's knocking at my door right but i'm available so what i try to do is be really good at everything not just one thing. I wanted to be the king of them all. I wanted to be the king of the logos and the king of 
uh, layout and production and editing and everything. Everything when it comes to doing artwork and, and production. So I guess website should be included because it really is just moving up from, and it really is like moving up from publishing. But there's all these things that, the technical web computer things that I haven't fully gotten my my head around. And I'm like, well, then if you're going to go the cheap way, you know, and add in the apps yourself, then, you know, it's going to require a little bit more, a little bit more knowledge. And it's like, oh my Lord, more crap to learn. And at some point you just start giving up because it's just been that way since graduating. So you go in, you get your great degree and you come out top 10, but then they're like, well, do you know Photoshop? What? Uh, yeah, I, I, I get, yeah, I get it. Do you have 10 years of Photoshop? No, I just graduated from top 10 with all these early world skills. You know, we did everything by hand. There wasn't computers. Everything was done old school. You know, computers were coming in, and yeah, I had a, a general idea. Okay, well, we can't hire you unless you have this Photoshop. Uh, okay. Well, do you know this? Do you know Adobe Illustrator inside and out? No. Well, we can't use you. Oh my God, so then you got to go learn that. And it's always something else. Then it's the next program, and the next program, and the next program. So I've tried to keep up, but at some point you just, you can't. All right. So the extent of my skills at the moment should be fully demonstrated at, at the website linked on the channel and in the chat room. So I beseech you, if you do think you need anything commercial art wise, Go look at the website. I've tried to demonstrate that I've done like one of everything. Including the, the videos on YouTube. Now, um, a lot of them don't, uh, a lot of them don't demonstrate my best artistic work because it was a learning process. And what I'm trying to say is some of the early music videos that I did that include my artwork, uh, time was a real big factor. Like you have a, you have a weekend to put together a video, a music video to this song and, uh, and storyboard it and learn how to do that and learn how to encode and get the encoding right. You know, so go, you have this weekend to do it. Oh, okay. So, you know, not being able to spend as much time as I wanted to always to make everything look absolutely beautiful in my earliest videos. And you and people will look at that and know that's the extent of your work. <laughs> well, you have to understand that back then there were no FAQs. There were no help files. This was all brand new. And at some point, somebody had to be one of the first ones to go, Oh, let me figure out the encoding so that I can make a still image remain crystal clear or close to it and get that uploaded to YouTube and to a video and have it encode properly so that, yeah, in the video, if you use still imagery, if you tried doing that when YouTube first started. <laughs> so uh, it took a lot of experimentation and a lot of trial and error. So uh, while you can look at, anybody can look at it with today's eyes, some of my earliest videos, and you're like a four-year-old could have done that. Well, today, a four-year-old can do that because now everybody knows who YouTube is. Everybody works with there. Everybody's, they're trying to, you know, they all, oh, your encoder does this and that, and I could put a setting in here for this and that. And But that wasn't available. 
Uh, and then there was all the legalities of what happens when you start working with other artists on YouTube and copyright issues and l exploring all of that as painful as that has been. But it had to be done. And so during that period, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not creating anything anymore because you guys are just out of your minds. And this is you. You've got this blah, 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 blah. 14 years later. Okay, we'll we'll let you monet we'll let we'll monetize you after fourteen years. Sorry about that. That's what they said. Sorry about that. <laughs> that is really cool. That city down there at the end of that river. That is badass. It is badass. Bridges. That's a place you want to ride in as Conan. That's right, I come from the mountains. All right, where are we? Not quite. And we missed the top of the hour celebration. I got going, talked, talked through it and didn't play the song. We have a few minutes. Let me go ahead and do that now. And then we go check that out. Check that out. Ah. I got to figure out a way to make it reset. Properly. I'm using Bandcamp. I need to talk to Arthur about all of this.
Good stuff. You and me, Arthur Yoria. This darn thing. They said they fixed the uh, image slideshow. And then we'd have to create new ones. So I just went to do it. And I'm not, you know, maybe I'm missing something with the, uh, with the parameters or properties. I thought it was, you know, just show anything, any artwork in the, uh, that's in the folder. But it doesn't seem to be showing everything. Huh. We'll see. All right, where are we? Da, 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 da. Lumbrical, part of the Chateau de Les Arts I Lachensis complex in Valencia, Spain, is a sculpture garden and landscaped walk with plant species indigenous to Valencia. It harbors in its interior the walk of the sculptures, an mm. outdoor art gallery with sculptures that is long. contemporary artists. The umbrical is a space that is a home to numerous sculptures surrounded by nature. It was designed by Santiago Colatrava as an entrance along the southwestern edge to the City of Arts and Sciences and as a cover over its car park. Lumbrical was completed in 2001. It's nice when the world is at peace as infrequent as that is but that there are times of peace that allow your society to create beautiful things beautiful artwork yeah it's looping the same ones it's not it's not going into all the other folders some strange well, there's one I have to keep an eye on that there's hundreds of pieces in there but again I'm seeing repeats so yeah back to art I have had an aunt Who came here, I believe. Uh, no matter where anybody was that was traveling the world, like, I'm going someplace, would you like me to get you something? The only thing I was ever interested in getting that I ever wanted from anybody traveling was a comic book. That's it. The local comic books and the ones in Spain were absolutely awesome. The, their comic books are hardbound. Mortadello and Philemon, the absolute greatest. The Spanish artists, the Spanish cartoonists, <laughs> a class all their own. I remember. Uh, cousin went to Italy same thing what do you want the comic book sent me a daredevil reprint done in Italian El Diablo okay we should be close close now Close enough. Let's call it in. LEMK. This one's for twenty-one thousand dollars. There it is. Aerodromo Forestal de Enguera. And the wind is blowing from the west. Right 
when we're 16. Arthur has announced that he's going to stop publishing music under Arthur Yoria. He said that's had its run. And I just can't imagine that. He is just such a talent. I just, it blows my mind. Thing never did it did move on okay yeah there we are all right where are we in the world we are here now I don't see the airport marker for the for it. It says twenty eight miles. Again, maps. I still don't see any airport markers. There's one. No. Oh, I don't see it. Well, no matter, we'll get there. Let's listen to the rest of this Roman Empire version from him, and then we'll move on to the Kings and Generals content. I need to mute that. Hit play. Skip. In 300 AD, the provinces of Hispania remain far away from the front lines and as such generally peaceful and prosperous. In the late 200s, the Emperor Diocletian reorganized the administration of the empire. He carved out three additional provinces from the massive province of Terraconensis to make the region more manageable. Galicia in the northwest, Carthagnensis in the southeast, and Hispania Balearica for the Balearic Islands. These six provinces, in addition to Mauritania Tingitana in North Africa, were organized into a diocese, the Diocese of Hispania, with Augusta Emerita as its capital. This new organization helped the empire as a whole deal with the new challenges it was facing, since the political organization that had worked for the previous several centuries was no longer adequate. Christianity also arrived slowly into the region, initially in only the cities, although by the late 300s all of Hispania was pretty thoroughly Christianized. Hispania did not escape the invasions in the 400s AD that led to the fall of the Western Roman Empire. In 409, various tribes, including the Suebi and the Vandals, invaded. The Roman Emperor... To me, that speaks of the, the work of the Templars they talked about, not too far from here, just behind us a little way, was an area that was totally in control by the Templars. And they changed everything. And all of a sudden, wabam! Everybody's, everybody's converted or ever, you know, and it, they haven't, they didn't say it was a hostile thing, convert or, and I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, maybe it was, convert or, you know, but that's not the MO usually, you know, that's the MO of the other guys, convert or,
So to me, that would explain, uh, that would speak to how well they did when they were put in charge. Could be wrong. We invited another tribe, the Visigoths, to oh, those guys. and kick the invaders out <laughs> in exchange for a Roman province for them to settle in. The Visigoths did what they were asked, and all the invading tribes were kicked out of Hispania into North Africa, except for the Suebi, who established themselves in Galicia. Yeah, and they're the making Visigoths themselves welcome again. These word for their service were awarded land. That's where we we get controversial. Look at look at how what they're doing again today. That's the, okay. It, look, the same thing is happening again right now, right? People that don't want to be cool want to, again, push back up into your territory, right? And then when they get here, they just act like fools and they don't contribute. They won't assimilate. They, they're, they're back to the same crap. And it sucks because it's creating wicked frictions. And... It's sad that, you know, history might repeat itself. If people don't chill the F out, AS, AFP, when uh, assimilating into territories, uh, yeah, it's inevitable. You're going to cause it to happen. With everybody, the education up high and everybody, at least you, now that you're here and you have access to internet and da 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 hopefully you get a quick education on the matter, the histories, and understand your place in causing things to recreate. And one of the big hopes with education in the world is that we would get to the point where we can start defying history and not having it repeat itself. I would really love it if we were the generation to finally do that. The historians like clockwork have it all mapped out, rise and falls of everybody, because it's been done over and over and over again. And our fall is mapped out too. And I was in high school very optimistic that by this time, we would be getting close to worldwide education enough across the board that we would all have at least the basic histories. And we could collectively say, oh, we got to all be really cool. And a lot of people are still fools out there. And you know what they say? It just takes one bad, bad apple to ruin the bunch, right? If it wasn't for, you know, Timmy, Ahmed, whatever their names are, if it wasn't for them, uh, we would, you know, everything would be fine. They ruined it for everybody. So with regards to everybody coming from these territories where they've been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And they were like, okay, well, 200 more years has passed. What, what, you guys have changed. Come on in. <laughs> nah, they're... It, it, it seems like it's going to happen again. It's going to go down again gonna force the situation again the latest one with the squatting that's like a military coming in and squatting and saying uh we can we can squat wherever we want that's a foreign army coming in saying that they can just take up residence in your residence and that's got to stop with a quickness there's so much open land too that they'd be like well if you're gonna come here you're gonna go live out there you see you go out there and you stay out there for a little while you build up out there and we'll come and uh, connect to you if you guys are really cool go work on that area of land over there and that one 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 there's all these open spots you go do your thing over there and we'll keep an eye on you and you do all right. Yeah, 
You'll get a Walmart. It's the ones that run, you know, come into the cities. Again, I'm, I'm going to take your house. <laughs> Hell you are. <laughs> crazy, crazy. So let's get landed and then we'll uh, find that King and General's channel video on uh, a particular general that they, I guess they found troublesome. Rome, anyway. It's all about this one guy, it seems. So looking back at this, I see the airport that uh, in the screen, but yeah, I don't see the airport out here. If large portions of this live stream are missing uh, then everybody had a problem with me using their content and I had to just chop it could cause the whole video to uh, just be removed hopefully not folks I like your content it really helps me get a it brings the territory so much to life and I'm also a big player of Rome Total War and flying these landscapes just is fantastic And uh, love history. Uh, it's because it's giving me these perspectives, you know. What do people mean when the history is repeating? So we got to know history. This is all part of that. And you're uh, to me, uh, in the, as a Western person, Western world person, you're able to come to conclusions about where to stand on it all and how to look at it all. And identify what's going on today in the world and again it's not this has happened once it's happened over and over and over and over and over Sorry, I'm bouncing her all over the place. Uh, I have the sensitivities. I really need to change the sensitivities. Because just the slightest touch, I'm really, really, really barely touching the joystick. And it's just all over. It's got to be from the fighter pilot settings. This is an interesting landing strip. Make sure we have full flaps. Get up over the dang trees are right there to the very end. That's crap. Uh, I'm going to do a go around. There's one going this way, too. I'm about stall speed. Go ahead and put in full propeller. That looks a little bit easier, maybe. Mm -mm. Yeah. Well, I was trying that. That it seems to be the best runway for the wind. You want to land into the wind. So with a short runway, the last thing you want is the wind pushing you faster. an eye on that so we don't stall uh, I should have counted to 30 
You greased that landing. Not really. I'm bouncing. Taxi to parking and shut down your engine. All right. Making $21,000. Take a stretch. Grab a Coke. Use the restroom. Whatever you need to do. But hurry. We've got miles to go still. There's our, our folks waiting for us. Do, do, do. All right. Let's go ahead and turn that off. And we'll hit continue. And hop out of the plane. Transporter. Cargo unloading in progress. I do not have the camping pack. I want to get it. I want to get it. I want to get it. Please like and subscribe. Subscribe. Do it. Do a super chat, will you? If you have uh, if you have the funds. In my chat room, you can super chat and donate. All right, so we got paid. Transporter, another cargo mission completed. Thanks, and see you soon. You are quite welcome. I like it when we get paid. Let's go. Uh, we have to find a job. And we need to find a job that takes us along the coast. Really? Come on. Really? All right, so what do you do in a, a case like this? You play the market, right? We, we, we need to get to at least Alamera. Almeria? Cartagena? Not the Joan Wilder Cartagena. Joan Wilder? Ultimately, I'd like to make it to here. Gibraltar. This is a big spot in Rome Total War. You you know, uh, just for securing all piracy and traffic that could be moving through here. So this is definitely a place you want to take. All right, so the market. Let's shoot for Almera first. At least it's close enough. It is uh, L-E-A-M. So let's go to our market button here. And we're at L L E M K. L E A M. So L E A M is buying what? Okay, uh, we can make five hundred and twenty seven in profit per unit of meat. Mm. All right, well, there's only meat here, so let's go ahead and go ahead and load up. We should probably get fuel first. So we don't load up on the meat and then 
run out of fuel. We can get 20 bundles, 20 parcels of meat for $43,000. That's a lot of meat. All right. So cargo. It says we're overweight by 44 pounds. Come to our weights. No, we're under. Two thousand two two hundred pounds. Well, us included in the flight. Ugh, look just all the way. People are big these days. We weigh a lot more. Again, lack of war and good times. Who's been bringing about the good times? We've been bringing about the good times. Not you guys. You guys have not been bringing about the good times. And you know who we're talking about. All these other people in the world who've not been bringing the good times to everybody. So then they come over here and they act fools and start a bunch of crap. When we've been the ones bringing the good times, bringing the parties, shake your groove thing. Let's put Leam, L E A M. L E A M. Enter. Enter. Let air traffic control know that we're leaving. Um, no wind data, but it was coming from the west.
You can get into a lot of bad habits with Neofly. It's, uh, especially with regards to missions that want you to get to places quickly or you'll fail. You, you have a time limit to get to your destination. And so, you know, taxing way faster than you should. Not doing proper flight plan planning. Just turn and burn. Okay. Let's set... 3,000 feet. Well, let's start at 15. Gotta worry about these mountains around here. And set flight level change. And nav is on. Go ahead and turn on the autopilot. Come on, you. You're supposed to flight level change. Climb to measure your climb. Never trust an autopilot. Ah! That's almost too close for comfort right there. You do a vertical speed. Oh, it's lagging. It's held to do fourteen hundred feet per minute. Full throttle. Is the pitch open up all the way? Propellers open up. Let's go conditioner. beautiful really really beautiful all these different places that I'm seeing I I can pick up like if I had to pick up and move and want to go someplace there are so many lovely places in the world where there's just nobody. Like, out here. Like, that place we just flew over. How is there not more houses in there? Wow. Seems like with this area, there'd be plenty of work to do. Gotta wonder if they have a comic book shop. A D and D, a D and D store with with books, a bookstore, specializing with in a Dungeons and Dragons stuff. All right, let's check. All right, put it into cruise. And just keep an eye on the 
brain in case we have to climb out there. Probably will, but we'll deal with that as we get a little bit closer. Let me find that Kings and Generals video on uh, Rome now. So you think you know Wix, but do you really? Oh, I know that you guys are full of it. I know that you guys are raising my rates from $7 a month to $23 a month. And I wish I could get the whole world to get on social media with me or send them mail right to the moment saying, that's unfair. That's unfair what you're doing to Kinius, man. $7 a month to $23 a month. And he's been begging you and begging you and begging you not to do this and to work out a deal for him so he doesn't have to leave. Because that's just entirely too much. But they have all these wonderful features that he doesn't use. See? So mad at them right now. The events of the first century BC shook the Roman Republic to its foundations and led to the formation of the empire. Many of these events, such as Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon, are well known, but there are ones that are overlooked. For almost a decade, a bitter guerrilla war was fought in the province of Hispania, where a rebellious Roman governor battled for survival against the full might of Rome. Welcome to our video on Sertorius and the Sertorian War. Shoutouts to Imperator Rome and Paradox Interactive for sponsoring this video. Oh, that's cool. The latest 1.3 update is now live, and it brings many new features and major changes to the game. There is now greater attention given to the characters, as the experience system makes them more important, while fewer major families to track means that each of them are more crucial. The national mission trees are reworked to help guide your actions. The free Punic Wars content pack fleshes out the Roman and Carthaginian factions even more. Ten unique Roman missions will be essential in the conquest of Italy. The free pack also adds the Numidian army model, Carthaginian ship model, and three new music tracks. For a week between the 3rd and 8th of December, this excellent game with endless replayability will be free to play on Steam. Support our channel and play Imperator Rome for free by clicking the link in the description. Born in Sabinium in 123 to a family of minor nobles, Quintus Sertorius was raised by his widowed mother, Rhea, whom Plutarch describes him as being excessively fond of. After a typical Roman education in rhetoric, martial skills, horse riding, and the Greek epics, Sertorius, far too ambitious to remain a provincial aristocrat, traveled to Rome and entered public life. His unique style of rhetoric elicited a comment from the great orator Cicero, who called Sertorius the roughest and readiest of all the illiterate ranters he'd ever heard. Probably not seeing himself as an orator prompted the inexperienced Sertorius to embark on the most respected Roman career path in the legions, which were at the moment facing the Cimbri threat. Serving under Quintus Servilius Capio, Sertorius was one of the few survivors of the disastrous Battle of Arasio. Sertorius pledged his service to Marius, a decision which charted the course of his life. He volunteered to serve as a spy, dressing as a Cimbri warrior, learning their tongue, and joining their attack on Hispania, a place with which he was to become intimately familiar. Sertorius slipped back to Marius when the Cimbri returned to Italy in 102 BC, and was rewarded for his valiant efforts. He probably fought with the legions at Aquisexte and Vercule, seeing the end of the Cimbri threat. He continued his service with the legions in Hispania, and then was a quaestor, the financial supervisor in Cisalpine Gaul. In 91 BC, the social war between the Romans and their Italic allies broke out. At first, Sertorius used his position to supply men and materiel from his province, but then marched south to fight in person. The early 30s rising star lost an eye in the vicious fighting, and when the war was won in 88 BC, emerged as a hero in Rome. However, the rivalry between Marius and Sulla stymied the Marian allied Sertorius's bid for election to the Tribunate. 
In the sullen civil wars that followed, we witnessed Sertorius's loyalty, straightforwardness, and mercilessness. He repeatedly questioned his commander's methods, such as the employment of a slave army in retaking Rome. One night, when this force was encamped in a theatre, Sertorius had his regular legionaries surround the camp and slay them using javelins. The new Marian leadership and Sertorius despised each other, so in 83 BC, Sertorius set out for Hispania to establish a Marian power base there. The province's fragmented geography was its strength. Hispania was dominated by a huge central plateau surrounded by mountains. Serving as strategic gateways to this otherwise almost impenetrable Iberian interior are five river valleys on the Atlantic coast and three on the Mediterranean, and this facilitated a divided political situation. When Sertorius arrived, around 40 tribes jostled for position and warred with one another, hemming the Roman-dominated regions to the Mediterranean seaboard. These tribes comprised three main groups. Iberians inhabiting the eastern coastal region, Aquitani living in the distant northwest, and a large assortment of mixed Celt-Iberian invaders occupying the central plateau. The Roman territory was divided between Hispania Cateria, nearer Spain, and Hispania Ulteria, further Spain. Sertorius was appointed the propraetor of these provinces by Marius. He needed to deal with untamed mountain tribes who still held sway in the Pyrenees, and aiming to save time, Sertorius bribed them, telling his outraged companions that, if a man has a lot to do, nothing is more precious than time. After getting through the treacherous mountains, he set to solidifying his power base with help from the warlike locals. So you want to know where to invest a thousand dollars right now? No. Forget about stock. No, 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 no. Sertorius addressed the rampant excesses of previous Roman administrations of Hispania, lowered taxes, and befriended or gradually endeared himself to the locals. Meanwhile, the civil war raged on in Italy. Refugees trickled into Sertorius's court, informing him that Sulla had won and then marched into Rome, brutally purging his enemies. Sertorius, of course, was on the prescription lists, and after Gnaeus Pompey subdued a Marian remnant in Africa, he stood alone in Hispania against the sullen regime. He prepared for the coming storm. In 81 BC, Sulla sent an army towards Iberia by land. Knowing that winter blocked any other route of approach, Sertorius sent a legion under Julius Salinator to fortify the Pyrenees mountain passes. It was a shrewd defensive move, and it made direct assault impossible, but Salinator was eventually betrayed by a subordinate at killed, allowing Sulla's army to penetrate deep into Hispania. Facing overwhelming odds and almost certain defeat, Sertorius and his 3,000 remaining troops fled to Mauritania early in the spring of 80 BC. The Moorish tribes didn't allow the renegades to move in, and Sertorius, advised by Sicilian pirates, attacked the Balearic Islands, where he was defeated in a naval battle by one of Sulla's Spanish governors. After a painstaking limp west to recover at the mouth of the Betis River, Sertorius finally set himself up in Mauritania properly, dislodging a hostile local king, easily absorbing a sullen army sent to deal with him, and ruling autonomously for a few months. The local population believes that the giant corpse of Antaeus, son of Poseidon and Gaia, was buried at a certain place in this small kingdom. One day he went to see for himself, and had the tomb excavated, and after supposedly witnessing the demigod's corpse, performed sacrifices and promoted the local traditions regarding the tomb. It shows just how good Sertorius was and would be when it came to integrating himself with his foreign subject peoples. His African kingdom was defensible and prosperous, but events across the straits would pull Sertorius in. Sulla's new governor, Perfidius, was oppressing the locals and invading their territory. The Lusitanians weren't going to take it, and invited Sertorius to lead their forces. After landing near Gibraltar in 80 BC, and meeting up with his new allies, he marched against Perfidius. Sertorius was cunning, and managed to lure Perfidius into a swampy estuary before slaughtering his army. The Sullans lost 2,000 men, and the entirety of Hispania. 
Sertorius then dispatched generals to mop up the remaining Sullens in the north and began planning. It was a big job. He had to remain a firmly Roman governor rather than an Iberian chieftain if clemency was ever going to be possible. But he also required the extensive assistance of local tribes in order to defend himself before it could be counted on. During this time, we begin to get a glimpse of Sertorius's complex character through the surviving sources. He seems to have been an industrious, charismatic leader, never fearful or excessively indulgent, notably eschewing drunkenness. According to Plutarch, he convinced many that he was a mild soul, best suited to quiet life, whose enemies had driven him to take up arms in his own defense and practically forced him against his will to become a soldier. His tendency to give generous gifts, practice gentle governance, and his reciprocity made Sertorius incredibly popular among the local tribes, while his tendency to share their burdens engendered intense loyalty with the troops. During the early part of his dominion over Hispania, a seemingly mundane event shows us how expertly Sertorius made use of anything to ingratiate himself with the Iberian tribes. A lowly hunter known as Spanus managed to capture an unusual white fawn out in the wilderness. Knowing that Sertorius had a habit of graciously accepting and then repaying such gifts, he took it to him. Soon the creature became quite tame, not minding the chaos of army camp life or the bustling city crowds. Seeing an opportunity, Sertorius proclaimed that the fawn had been sent down to him by the goddess Diana and routinely revealed hidden information to him. When he received covert intelligence that an enemy was marching against him, for example, he would inform the tribes that it was instead Diana who had given him the information. Sertorius's people began to believe they were being guided by godly power rather than the will of mortal foreigners, and that made them all the more willing to go along with what their governor was doing. Rebellious Hispania would need all the help it could get, as Sulla's replacement governor was on his way with an army. This was Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius, consul for 80 BC, who hated the Marians. Sertorius began drilling his troops over winter. The tribes, especially the Lusitanians, were keen to face the legions, but their commander realized that trying to make his troops into inferior copies of the Romans would just lead to defeat. So he adapted, making use of their natural strengths. When Sertorius's words didn't convince his allies, he resorted to an object lesson to convince them. He had two horses brought before the tribal council, one a large powerful steed and the other a smaller weaker pony. Then he asked an elderly man to pluck out the hairs of the strong mount's tail one hair at a time, and a young strong man to rip out the tail by force. The weaker what? older man accomplished his task of retrieving the hairs, while the younger man only succeeded in exhausting himself. Sertorius then explained that the Roman army was much like the tail of a horse. Confront the legions all at once, and victory would be impossible. But pick them apart piecemeal, and they can be overcome. This argument convinced the tribes, and they quickly be All right, then that's been presented a lot of different ways through history right that's the that when people use the word fascist you've got to know where the word comes from and what was just demonstrated by the one guy flicking plucking the horse's tails and the other guy trying to pull it all out at once it's the same thing it's like caesar or somebody at one point saying you see this the stick here take the stick and break it so the guy breaks it, and then he says, here, take this bundle of sticks and try to break it. And they can't. So the symbol of Rome itself, what they're always carrying, not the big eagle on the top, it's usually the centerpiece of the poles that they carry the into battle, right? And it's a main pole, your main pole, that's surrounded by a bunch of small poles and then strapped together. And then they have the emblems on top. It's called a fasci. So when people use the word today, fascist, they use it in a bad way. They mean it negatively. 
But that's all it means is, look, you've got, we, they're blaming you for sticking together. You fascists. Yeah, but look at you guys. I mean, we're, we were over here having a good old time and then you guys show up and, you know, you're, you're bringing everything down and you're causing a lot of problems and yeah. So, you know, we do need to stick together. Now you can join us. And we all stick together and everybody's cool and we can party and have a good time. Or, yeah, we have no choice but to stick together. And so a lot of people are being called fascists today in the United States of America. And they want you to think it is bad. Why would you not want Americans to stick together? When you understand all of history... And how it's not over yet by any means. Look at the forces that have been in play from the start. And look at the way that they wage war on each other. And, you know, like they say, a nation divided can't stand. So I have to question politically. What are you saying? I see what you're doing, which other countries have done in the past before they fell, like inviting a bunch of people in to share in the party, to try to have power and remain in power. And you just ruin everything. And, you know, then everybody gets mad and we have to push everybody back, which is sad. But we have no choice. Uh, what happens, though, at that point is they usually just, the empires collapse, the nations collapse. And everything seems to be, sadly, and I'm, I'm kind of aping what people are saying right at the moment, but I feel it too, that, you know, we're in a period of collapse. And that's right where they want us. That's right what they have wanted. Every time there's been a step towards taking over and overthrowing the Western world, they'll take it. They always have, and they haven't stopped, and everything today is the same thing. that We've been following this whole journey now since Macedon. And while we were in a Macedonia, and we made it to Mesopotamia, and it started getting all Anunnaki and Sumerian. You see how much longer it's been going on. So, you know, you have to pick a side. I guess you don't. You could be very Spock and neutral about the whole thing. It's just a human being experiencing life on this planet in your life. But I look at the history from both sides, and I have to say that I don't appreciate the way that the Eastern world from Mesopotamia, how they feel we should live, people should live. Flying around their country, there's nothing, nothing. They might have some greatness in a few little spots. But there's nothing. They have nothing. There aren't airports everywhere you throw a stick. There aren't cities everywhere. There aren't modern cities everywhere. There's a lot of nothingness. They have not done all these, a lot of these people have not done well for their people since that time. And that is evident as we fly around. It can't be any more clear. Who has advanced civilization and humankind for better or for worse? But we're here to learn. Take all this planet and learn, right? You got to learn. Well, who's done the best learning? Who has advanced civilization the most? All those that have, you know, hey, good job. Good job. Some, 
societies that I still, you know, don't fully understand the way that they've managed to do it with the people. Uh, I think we've done a fantastic job. I think America has uh, the great experiment. I mean, look at look at when you fly over the United States of America and then fly over any place else in the world. I think we've demonstrated we we did a pretty damn good job in such a short amount of time. You've had thousands of years up to, and you've even had more hundreds and hundreds of years up to this point where we're flying over maps of you now. And this is what you've done? Okay. So it is not wrong for a person who has studied history to live in the United States of America right now and using history as a guideline to be against all these other circumstances that, that caused everybody up to this point to collapse. I don't want it to. You shouldn't want it to either. So... Maybe it's not such a bad idea at this time in history in the United States of America as a citizen to want to be fascist. And as Americans, we've got to stick together and understand history. What people's intentions have been from the start. And just recognize it. It's not, it's, it's just the way it is. In that regard, it's not good or bad. It's just that until it stops, that's the way it is, and they don't want to stop. So if we want to end up like them and let them be in charge, I don't think so. That's very pretty down there. Wouldn't you love to have a house right there? That's your house. It's all perfectly terraformed. Oh, you got your own little pool lake. In Roman uh, times, the size of your pools was an indication of the size of your wealth. Think about that often. If I ever came into money... Look at that guy's pool. Oh, you think you've got a pool? So yeah, if I ever came into it, just stupid money, uh, you know, even good money. And where to just go out and get a, a plot of land? Doesn't have to be big. Just, you know, small little plot, couple acres. I'm not that ambitious. Uh... <laughs> But the first thing, the pool. Design the pool or multiple pool structures. I like the idea of designing multi-layer and with waterworks all the way down to the bottom as low as possible so that if you get any rain and snow and ice, the first thing you do is design all your above-ground surfaces to be able to uh, have every bit of moisture um, to be able to move it, to drain it. There's the word, drain. What the? To be able to drain all, um, all water, any water, any ice, any snow to your lowest level so that you can... Uh, always have pools of cool water or if you're low enough area ice chambers sometimes people don't believe me when i talk about that but it's they're true it's absolutely true i've heard of root cellars but ice cellars you bet you bet somebody told me the lower you dig the warmer it gets i'm like what no the lower you dig the colder it gets 
But what about the Earth's core? Well, that's a long ways down. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's the first 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet. It's going to get colder as you go down. So there is a way to take any snow and ice and get it down into your lowest point of your whatever you're building and keep it ice and snow year round. So they would build these giant rooms, giant refrigerator rooms specifically for snow and ice. So that they could have ice. There was a big punk, you know, when you punk somebody. The um, Islamic Muslim army, when they took it to the Templars and Christians at one point in the Holy Land, the uh, Templars or whomever they were, they believed that they could just rush out there and get them, and they ended up exhausting their men to the point of complete dehydration by the time they met the other army. Just the stupidest thing ever. And they got their asses handed to them. And when the guy who, the general who was leading for the Templars are good guys, in my opinion, when he had to go before the guy that just kicked his ass, the guy broke out ice water. He's like, you want some ice water? Chump. That was a. <laughs> that's a. That's punkin. I wish certain people throughout time weren't so hard lined. That makes me mad. To make your people just. There's no way out. If you're going to be one of us, you see. There's no way out. You you must do what do what we command. There isn't any other there isn't. That's the command. And that is kill everybody else. If we could get them past that point to the point of oh man. You know how much more money we could make by just playing on ancient aliens tourism? We could bank. We could we could be the greatest. We have all the coolest, amazing, mind-boggling histories buried in the ground here. Why don't we just commit ourselves to that? Getting some Walmarts and some... Uh, shopping malls, even though those are kind of dying out now. Maybe there will be a revival. Even movie theaters are going. Either way, it would be nice if certain peoples on this planet just gave up their ingrained notion of we must dominate it's either us or there's 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 nothing else it's us or nothing and that's just too harsh that's just too harsh of a way you can't how do you how you know and we've seen through how the western world is have you know how they've had to deal with it it's been non-stop This is really trippy. All the little roads everywhere. We're industrious. Good for you. Right on. We need to get places. We need to dig mines. Oops. Awesome. In modern mines... You're like, man, why don't we just build residences in here? Holy, man. Everything's all perfect, split level. Yeah, I mean, you are underground, but so what? Mm 
my wife says I'd be I'd be happy living the way that the dwarves do. Because in The Sims, I always build underground. Because I, I don't like, again, I don't like messing with Mother Nature. That actually, she should appreciate that as an elf. I haven't really put it to her that way before. Maybe I should. Um, she's like, you're so happy living underground. I'm like, yeah, because it's cool. It is cool. I, I don't mind it at all. All that extra space. Nice and cool. All right. Oh, something I wanted to show you. Um, and we'll get back to the uh, Sertorius here. I don't want to be too long about it so that you forget what we're hearing. But I want to show you. Rome, is it up? Okay. You should be seeing Rome Total War on the screen. Now, look in the small map in the corner. I'm sorry that it can't make it bigger with this particular game. We need a new version, badly. Okay, everything in the red in the lower map there is me. It's Rome. And I've risen to a republic. And I've managed to acquire a lot of wealth. And I've been friends with everybody for the most part. All the people around me I've tried maintaining great friendships with and only having to go to war if they needed help. And they needed help. And okay, we'll push into here. And then they're like, you're so cool. We'll just give you territories. And in doing so, I did mismanage the Empire somehow, and I caused several civil wars to happen, and I don't fully understand why yet in this game. I did the best I could. I have not been playing Ruthless Rome at all. I've been playing like, I'm the, the best king, the best steward. And in doing so, I've also had to come over here and enter. See, I didn't mess with them up here, and they've given me that territory in the middle. So I didn't mess with the Gauls. I just became friends with them all, or all the people around Massilla, Messina. Let's see over here, Massacilla. So I was friends with these people, and uh, they've been really cool. But now they're they've taken a large chunk of the world up above, and they they really could if they decide to turn mean. This is going to be wicked, because. They control everything up here. But anyway, I had to come into Spain too. So it's been real eye-opener in the simulator to fly around and now see these lands from the simulator point of view. They did a good job with the mountains. We've definitely seen all this coming down here. Right? It's been perfect. And he talked about how impassable some of these places were, and they are. You can only bring your armies, like, up through here. You can only come in that way, or you have to go all, all the way around. Now, he's going to talk about moving as the Roman, this dude, moved south uh, from Taraco. <laughs> he had to go to Ars. Court Hadisht, or Hadisht, whatever. And he had to come south this way, and then Cordoba, Cartuba up here, you have to go around this way. You can't go, yeah, anyway, you can't go straight. It's either this way or that way. I think this is actually where Cordoba's down at. Maybe I'm wrong. But very important place to get to here and take this so you can hold this. You want to control the flow of traffic. And yeah, it does feel like 200 years when you have to come over and take this place. It is really tough. They're good fighters. And you have to have a really good army. So, that's how I did it. 
and we're going to now and we're roughly here at the moment let's see let's double check okay yeah we're on that the final curve Um, yeah, did it switch? No, it didn't. One moment. That's what I was showing. Zoomed out. Here we are in the blue triangle. Zoom back down in. Well, here's that curve, the last curve, before it goes over to Gibraltar. Okay. Back to Rome. So the last curve. Okay. Where are we? 27 minutes after the hour? We should do a break at the bottom of the hour. Began to train, learning Roman style formations, signals, and tactics, transforming you go there into a true army. When Mateus oh, yeah, the fascist stuff. Spania in 79 BC, the Satorian commanders were ready for him. Metellus's army began to suffer devastating harassment, making foraging and scouting lethal. Proving himself a genius in guerrilla warfare and a peerless leader of men. At one point, the middle-aged Sertorius challenged his opponent to single combat. Metellus declined, and forever after, Sertorius would derisively call him the Old Woman. This irregular warfare finally ground the Roman campaign to a halt, when, a year after it began, news came from Rome that Sulla had passed away. With his um, bye -bye. unity gone, Metellus chose to take a passive approach. Sertorius wasn't as idle, and used the free hand to subdue more Iberian tribes in the interior who hadn't submitted yet. The gains increased the amount of Spanish silver that flowed into his treasury, and allowed him to prepare for the resumption of war. Resume it did in 76 BC, in the form of future triumvir Gnaeus Pompey, who chased a rebellious Roman commander called Perpenna into Hispania. The latter had been forced to join up with Sertorius by his anxious soldiers. The confident and careless Pompey threw his veteran legions onto the Iberian Peninsula, but he too was quickly outmatched by the lightly armoured and mobile Sertorian troops. Within just a year, two entire legions of Pompey's army had been shredded by Sertorius and his brilliant generalship. However, we don't just get an impression of Sertorius's military genius, but also his sense of honour and justice. When they captured Lauron in 76 BC, a notoriously savage cohort of Perpenna's newly arrived Roman legions began committing rapes in a conquered city. Sertorius, unwilling to tolerate this horrific conduct by his own troops, had the entire unit executed. They served as an example. No further such incidents are known to have occurred. A climactic battle occurred in 75 BC at the Sucro River, when Sertorius saw an opportunity to eliminate Pompey before Metellus could intervene. He sent Perpenna back to delay Metellus, and then engaged with Pompey. About evenly matched in numbers, each general lined up on their own right wing and charged at the opposing flank. Pompey fought a duel against a giant Iberian infantryman, and his wing began to push the Sertorians back. Sertorius learned about this threat and reacted swiftly, riding over to his left, rallying those whose morale was faltering, and pushing forward those who remained stalwart. The Pompeian right collapsed and routed, a turn of events which seems to have taken Pompey himself by surprise. He escaped only at the very last moment by dismounting from his ornately clad steed. After tidying up the other wing, the battle ended and night In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you how to get 1 million views uh -oh. in your niche in the next 30 days. My name is Adley and my company Viralish helps talent. I'm sorry, Mal, I can't. I can't even. 
fell. I know I need the help. I really do. It was in a terrible I get position, it. And almost certainly would have been destroyed the next morning. However, Metellus arrived at dawn. Okay, now if it's the same Pompey, right? Aren't we dealing with the same Pompey that traveled with Alexander the Great? Or is this a different guy? Because if it is, it, that's that's been his job. His bit, job has been to just hold that wing. And he doesn't necessarily advance for the glory. He just has to make sure that that side holds. And backing up isn't a defeat where that tactic is concerned. It is it is to, if you have to back up, you back up. Um, but you have to be able to really, really hold hold that side. Anyway, let's, uh, let's keep going. We're almost done here. Having bested Perpenna and saved Pompey from utter disaster in the nick of time. Uh-huh, always. Victorious knew that he had lost a great chance to end one of his rivals and stated scornfully, if the old woman had not made an appearance, I'd have thrashed the boy and packed him off to Rome. The great Sertorian leader was embarrassing both Metellus and Pompey, but he couldn't be everywhere at once. So gradually, the war began to turn and Rome's seemingly infinite resources began to have their effect. In addition to warfare, Romanization of the wild and unconquered barbarians was also on Sertorius's agenda. His methods of integrating and transitioning the population would, as Dr. Philip Matijek points out, become standard procedure in the later Republican and Imperial eras. Sertorius was a true pioneer who impacted centuries of world history. He introduced Roman equipment to the Iberian tribal leadership by liberally distributing gifts of legionary-style helmets, gladii, tunics, and cloaks for service and loyalty. As they embraced these replacements with enthusiasm, so did their people. To promote a sense of Iberian unity, Sertorius moved his capital to Oscar. Iberian warrior leaders made up his retinue and were thus Romanized, and Sertorius did the same for their children by setting up an academy in Osca, much like the one Philip II of Macedon established in Pella for the offspring of... Actually, I do want to stop right there. I want to take you back to Rome too for a minute and show you how they, how they handle that in that game. Okay, so he's talking about the Romanization of people. So if we come up here where he set up his capital... And that's kind of where I'm at. I've got a, a unit here because I am really worried about these guys changing their loyalty at some point and becoming hostile. And that's going to be a bad thing. Right? But got our fingers crossed that, that things work out. Okay. Um, the city itself. Okay. Uh, this over here, public order, culture details... Um, they're happy. They're Latin. It says 51.8%. Uh, so they're, they're changing. I'm not seeing any of the Hellenistic, Celtic, or Eastern. There's 3%. There it is. 3.8% Eastern culture. 9.4% Celtic. 35% uh, and dropping for Hellenic. And we're on the rise at 51, so we're doing a good job. And we've put in a port, we've got a, a gallery, or you know, we've got a good military here. And a Basilica of Minerva. Uh, I'm taking a negative 8 to food, but I get a public, uh, 8 public order per turn. Research rate, plus 2 Latin cultural influence. Romanization edict plus eight conversion to Latin culture. I've also got this guy out here, Publius Minicius Agrippa. He is a, a patrician. Okay, and he's going to level up here. Administration advises local officials, thereby increasing tax rates. While helping protect local settlements against authoritarian agent actions, this agent is deployed within this province. Okay, agent view, details, and he's going to get promoted. So, he's a propagandist. You say masquerade, I say trivial skirmish. 
plus three authority, plus six cultural conversion in local province. Embezzler, the gold was just uh, resting in my purse. <laughs> plus two zeal, plus six wealth from all sources. Local region. Pet snake hiss, plus five chance of wounding enemy agents in self-defense. Actually, is very good. And we get to a new one. Desert Prophet, I see plans within plans. Plus one cunning, plus one line of sight. Witch, weak as a woman's magic. No, wicked as woman's magic. Twisted Assassin, a human computer with the soul of a cold-eyed killer. In the wrong game, plus five research. We don't need that anymore, really. I think we've out, we managed to kick everybody's butt as far as education rates. I like I like this one. Plus one cunning, plus one line of sight. Alright, and he's got another one here. Tax collector. One for me, one for the treasury, one for me, one for the treasury. Negative five cost of performing all actions. Plus three tax rate in local province. Bread and games edict. Plus three public order. So we want to raise that stat or we can pick a new one. So this would give us a plus six to public order. And I'll take it. And we can raise them again. Can't go up and do another one of these, but we can add one. Underhanded. He can discredit people. Plus three chance of, of a critical chance. Oh, boy. Plus three chance of criti critical success in all actions. Plus two, loyalty for the political party. Another cunning. If I move him into other territory, he can steal gold. Plus five, tax rate. Negative one, public order. Convert. Increase cultural conversion by plus five in target settlement. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it again. So raise that one. And again. Wow, okay. Do, 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 do. Uh, I think he's... Anyway, we have a spy down here too. Anyway, I wanted to focus on the cultural conversion since they just mentioned that in that video. That... Um... Now, I don't know how you see this these conflicts. Oh, that's Chris, one moment. Oops. I just hung up on Chris. Uh-oh. And I'm in low power mode. Sorry about that, and I even disconnected you. I'm sure I am. Okay. Okay, where were we? Gotta get my headphones back on. Cultural conversion. Uh, I was saying, I don't know how you see this conflict. And, you know, Rome, the bad guys, they came in, they did all this. And, uh, again, if if we look at what they're talking about, what has taken place before Rome came in, who was who was pushing up? Who was creating a bad time for everybody? You know, who wasn't doing such a great job of of running things? And, you know, people weren't happy and they weren't getting baths and aqueducts and... Right? So, um, and also bad blood. With Persians and Arabs and everybody from the southern regions and just the way that they run things they're you know uh, just a big bunch of downers so i see the way the romans are looking at it well you know one it's an obligation of theirs to to push them back because you've been at war with them forever 
and you you have no choice because you know civilization's not going to advance you know well i mean you're they're doing it for the greater good well yeah they were in this case advancing civilization and doing the best for every possible human that's your job they took stewardship as seemingly overhanded as they may have seemed. Nobody else was going to do that for the people. They weren't interested in it in, in, in some ways, it seems. In uh, giving their people those things. Sewers and aqueducts and... I, you know, I don't know. As a Western guy, I, I always find a way and an excuse, I guess, to always side with whatever the people in the, from Greece and Rome and Macedon and all the Western world, how they've dealt with it. And I find myself on their side. Okay. Of his nobility. A fine Greek and Roman education was given here, and Sertorius promised that it would lead to administrative positions and power for the educated scions in time. These children were also de facto hostages to ensure that the chieftains continued being loyal to Sertorius. In the meantime, he also looked after the Romans who had come to him as refugees, forming a senate oh, and appointing wow. caesars and praetors. Oh, we're here. Number. It was quickly becoming a Rome outside of Rome, and it was clear that despite his alienation from his mother country, Sertorius was a fervent advocate of Roman values. Despite his military genius and overtures to Mithridates in the east, Roman reinforcements kept coming, his enemies got better, and his allies proved not equal to the task at hand. Perpenna blundered into several defeats and lost almost all of his own legionaries. As Sertorian fortunes gradually worsened and his territory was rolled back, Metellus offered a generous reward of 100 talents and amnesty to any traitor who killed his enemy. The Romans with Sertorius began to scheme and plot, Perpenna foremost among them. Hearing about this through his phenomenal intelligence network, Sertorius, according to Livy, changed into a savage and dissolute man succumbing to vice and brutality, and abandoning himself to wine, women, and song. Many of the children at his academy were enslaved or executed as punishment for their tribe's crimes. Increasing numbers of them were slowly making deals with Metellus. Naturally, this led more people to conspire as well. Perpenna, attending one of the many austere banquets hosted by his nominal master, assassinated Sertorius with a hidden sword along with a group of conspirators in 72 BC. The Sertorian War largely ended with the death of Sertorius himself, and the victorious Pompey captured and executed Perpenna. The tribes went back to being a nuisance for Rome, but Sertorius played a large role in bringing Hispania into the Roman fold, and the provinces would remain crucial for the Roman economy for the next five centuries. We always have more stories to tell, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one. Oh, I loved it. I love their stuff so much. Do, 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 do. We didn't do the break. We didn't do the smoke break. Time has moved on us so fast. We're already here. Here's today's song of the day as we come in for a landing. And I'm going to try to turn up the graphics here. Get nice and pleasant. Hopefully it doesn't stall too much.
It cut the song off. <laughs> okay. Still using autopilot at the at the moment. Making little adjustments here, little adjustments there. easy to forget to breathe. Arthur's right. I do need to talk to him. Uh, I think I might have to make him create a copyright incident between us so that we get the share option to show up. Not sure what to do yet. wide I guess we don't have any detailed maps of this place photogrammetry doesn't look all that stunning That is pretty. All right, better stop pulling around. Pull flaps. Turn off the autopilot. 
and slow down. Oh yeah, we got a whole bunch of meat on board. Need to sell that. So as we have seen again, from what the Greeks were trying to do, the Rome, uh, what Alexander was trying to do, and with the Romans, what they were trying to do. And especially all the way back to Alexander, we were hearing in almost every case after liberating or taking over a place, trying to restore it to democracy. Uh, I really wish they would say that he was trying to restore Republic, the Republic, because that's stronger but what he was at least trying to do was restore democracy in these territories. Now, the Romans are more about the Republic. I'm not sure about exactly at this time. It devolved into a... That was a harder landing than we like to see, pilot. Eh, it's just meat. Sorry, I'm bruising your meat. Contact ground for your parking assignment, then shut down your engine. So that's another reason why I look at the conflict as it is. Um, uh, at least democracy. You know, if the people are smart at that point, you know, trying to restore their territories into a republic would be much better. Now, historians will absolutely say that during periods where there were was Republican government. That style has done the best for civilization. The most people prospered, the most people were happy, more freedoms, more creativity, more way more growth. Right? And I'm all about that on planet Earth. I'm all about the people getting good stuff and everybody's happy and right and we will then try to keep our education level and up logic education levels high enough for the people to understand that look all we are is back to a democracy we're at least restored to a democracy or we're devolving into one and the best thing we can do is be smart people and realize we need to get back to a republic and hold it as long as we can. And that is exactly where we're at again today. That's exactly what's going on today. I don't see how I can be wrong when we're looking at all of this history. There's always two sides to the picture, right, though? I kind of see it that the way that they feel that uh, they have to be the ones that that win or rule is because they're associated with the first the real civilizations. But the same people that set them up set up shop everywhere else. And so I think it's a matter of now look at the merits, look at what what each faction or whatever you want to call it, what each group has done since civilization began. And sure, they might have a couple of really, really, really nice things and examples of of high culture, but is it everywhere? Did all the pe people prosper? Does everybody have sewers? Does everybody have Walmarts? Does everybody, you know, who's done who's done the best? And I think that's 
that's the way it's supposed to be. Not just because you are associated with Sumer and Ur and you're closer to the knowledge that a lot of people don't have and there's no divine right. They weren't divine to begin with. Someone said that's blasphemy. Hey, you know what? According to the translations, they say it themselves. We're not gods. You know, we are just people with some really cool technology. Just like you. So, they put a lot of people in charge. And then they fought amongst each other a lot too. And I still, again, think it all comes down to, okay, well, after the thousands of years that we've been here now, who has done the best? Who's, you know, who has Hollywood? Who has MTV? Who had, you know, Disneyland? Who made it fun for the people? Who made things a good time? Who created disco? Right? Who has managed to make this world party harder than anybody has partied before? And I think the answer is clear. So if I'm a fascist, I guess I'm a rock and roll, red, white, and blue, Western world, Disneyland kind of fascist. And I think we should stick together to pervert, to perverse. Yeah, now things become perverse. We have to fix that too. That's another story. Be gads, man. And madam. Um, I need to shut down or we don't get paid. And we, or we can't sell our meat. Turn the plane off anyway. We are done for the day. And let's go. Back over here and sell the meat. Oh. All right, well, we sold the meat. We're just barely making even. It's really tough if you don't have a full crew working at the same time. But I don't want to pay for that patch. I played with it. I like it. But with with hiring other pilots, if you do get that package, uh, I was able to immediately... Well, not immediately. You, if, through Sky Dude Adventures 1 through 100, maybe... Or maybe less than that. I use them to uh, get up to 9 million. Okay. Do, do, do. And I think that's it. That's all we needed to do. Okay. I enjoyed it. I love the history stuff to go along with all this. And again, uh, I got to finally show you today Rome Total War. And how I've done so far with uh, these thoughts in my head about all of this. Um, and approach Rome Total War from that perspective. And so far, doing really, really well. I, and uh, I'd really like to do some live streams on this. And um, this this is the first time I played through where I've made it this far at all. It is a very, very, very difficult, difficult game. And not having any sense of history makes it more difficult. And there's a lot of systems to it, like the political system and uh, the Senate. And 
spies and diplomats and diplomacy, uh, trade, yada, 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 all the, the Romanization stuff, cultural conversion stuff. On top of you can micromanage every single battle, which I don't normally do. Because I kind of still suck at that. I'm not that great of a general. They make it seem so easy in these videos. Oh, they just held their flank here and they pushed open a hole here and came through and it was over. It doesn't really seem to go my way when I try to micromanage the battles. Although you can do it in Rome Total War. It's amazing. Amazing, amazing. All right, so we'll pick it up tomorrow here. Uh, I didn't hear from... Um, let me double check the chat. Nobody showed up today. Um, Gibbons. Gibbons subscribed. Let's see if I can go to the Gibbons channel. No, it'll take me to the... I wish Gibbons would have said hi in the chat room. It makes it so much easier. If, for you, if you say a hi... In the chat room, I can immediately click on your name and go to channel and, and subscribe to you. By doing it this way, where stream elements is just let me know that you're subscribed. If I try to go to channel, it goes to their channel. Stream elements, not to Gibbon's channel. So then I'd have to go back out to my dashboard. Let me see. I need to go to my YouTube dashboard. And... pretty much end the live stream and go back into the studio or the, yeah go into the studio and the stream go to the dashboard go to subscribers find Gibbons and hit subscribe that way so please make it easy on me come into the chat room and say anything you suck whatever say anything and it gives me the option to go right to your channel and two clicks man and I've subscribed I don't have to go hunting around So thank you for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. Again, uh, I didn't hear anything from uh, Henning today on, you know, doing any DCS world or anything like that. So we'll probably just pick it up tomorrow and try to at least get through Spain. Start heading north again. Okay. See you tomorrow, folks.